Welcome to another episode of the Truth About Real Estate Investing Show for Canadians. This is Erwin Cito. And do your friends invest? Uh, most of my friends uh, that I spend time with these days are uh, serious investors. Many of them are my clients of Stock Hacker Academy or uh, my real estate business, uh, I Win Real Estate. Uh, I also meet uh, once a month with some uh, super elite real estate investors like Susan White. You know, she owns well over 20 properties. She's owned way more than that. It's just what she has left. Rachel Oliver, who's done hundreds and hundreds of rent-to-owns. Aaron Moore, who is one of the most successful wholesalers in Canada. Ryan Carr, uh, you know, Mr. Highest and Best Use, new author. You know, dude does like six to eight pretty fair-sized deals every 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 year. And uh, this past week, uh, we had a more social meeting that our... Um, Instead of our regular formal business updates and reviews, um, we meet. We used to, when it's not summer, we meet and give updates on our businesses and our lives, and we we do a business. Each person takes a turn to do a business review once a month. So it only happens once a month, and that takes like a bit more time. But anyways, uh, like always, I like to mix things up, <laughs> and including to do something fun. So after lunch uh, with them with our mastermind group, we had some jet skis booked. Uh, good news, bad news. The bad news was two of the jet skis were damaged. Uh, unfortunately, some folks were not very safe. One person even ended up in the hospital. This is not us. This is the previous weekend or something like that. Uh, so we were short a jet ski. But good news was the operator of the business let me rent her personal jet ski. <laughs> uh, she did. She did ask us to be careful with her baby. <laughs> I do my boating license, so she only let the uh, three of us have boating licenses. So she let two of us uh, ride, drive her drive her jet ski. Uh, I'm guessing that uh, afforded us some more faith in our ability to keep her her baby safe. Uh, from there, we cruised the shorelines of Lake Simcoe from uh, Friday Harbor, which is in Innisfil. To uh, to we made it almost all the way to Barrie, Ontario. Uh, the rental jet skis topped out at uh, 60 kilometers an hour versus the uh, the jet ski I was on went over 80 kilometers an hour, which is both fun and scary at the same time. <laughs> but but anyways, like cruising at 40 kilometers an hour is plenty fun. I, I can get the uh, the appeal that motorcyclists experience, uh, you know, um, we're on the open water, they're on the open air, you know, sun and, sun and wind in our faces. And while we get to, and for us we get to observe the the beautiful mansions that uh, that line the shores of Simcoe, Lake Simcoe, uh, really impressive stuff. It's actually funny we I, we we took a pause to look at a boathouse, and the boathouse I didn't know it was a boathouse. I thought it was a cottage, and it had it it, um, it had uh, an apartment on the top on the lower level. It was a boathouse, so it looks kind of like a garage. Uh, like a, so it'd be similar to like a laneway house, a pretty big laneway house. And that kind of laneway house would probably cost like 250000 to, to build, maybe more, because not because we're talking about boathouse, it's on water, I don't know. Uh, maybe it doesn't have a foundation. Anyways, I'm sure it's over two hundred grand to, to build. It looked gorgeous. And I thought, again, I thought that was the cottage, and then I looked past it, and I saw what looked like a 4,000 square foot ma uh, ginormous mansion. So pretty crazy what these folks are up to, and how much money folks have out there that are out there. Anyways, uh, we got caught up on the important stuff uh, when we're done jet skiing. You know, at lunch and dinner, we got caught up on the important stuff: family, health, uh, business. Uh, funny, a funny thing is, uh, not once was the the Toronto Maple Leafs or the Blue Jays mentioned. <laughs> I did, however, lobby a certain wholesaler in the group to send me deals if he comes across any that are in Hamilton that can be duplexed, if they should come available. I lobbied another member to allow me to, to invest in one of their business uh, projects. <laughs> and this is what I enjoy. I enjoy hanging out with great people uh, who, stretch my, who stretch my thinking. Uh, they're extremely successful in their areas uh, that they focus in. And uh, yeah, it's just great to... Uh, be around these people and enjoy great food, great wine, um, nature. Uh, our mastermind group actually, um, so we've actually been together for seven years. Sorry, the group's been together for seven years. I was invited to join four years ago. And the crazy part is there's no cost to join this group. Not, I'm not saying we're taking anyone on because we actually aren't. I think we're pretty much maxed out at eight people. Uh, but for those who've been around masterminds and research masterminds, you know, the good ones usually cost a lot of money, right? 10 grand is usually on the low end for masterminds, and I've heard several that are thirty to $50,000 per year. Often that's American dollars. So, uh, and then for free masterminds, uh, it's basically unheard of 
for, for masterminds to stay together that are free. Uh, so I personally, I'm grateful for the group, uh, the friendships, and the investment opportunities. <laughs> Uh, also super awesome was uh, we did a group med guided medication uh, meditation <laughs> meditation please <laughs> while as we were sitting by the water my friend Rachel uh, she was using her a phone app of hers uh, for a guided meditation and so we sat in silence uh, for around 15 minutes and one of the questions asked about uh, what when, what are your gifts right and that triggered some ideas uh, so I opened my, my eyes uh, I need to jot down some notes. I grab my phone um, and to make some notes and to make notes of who to call. Uh, so yes, I did break my meditation, but after I put my phone down, an eagle flew by right in front of us, only about 30 meters away, just over the water. Uh, maybe it's a sign I was on the right path to start a fund, uh, but we'll see. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my friends who were meditating properly <laughs> missed out on seeing the eagle. Um, but yeah, but that brings us to this week's show. We have YouTuber, real estate, and stock investor uh, Griffin Milks on the show. He's uh, he's he's pretty big on YouTube. I believe he has eighty-two or eighty-four thousand subscribers. He's only twenty-four years old. Uh, for many, for many, he was set in life. Uh, he had a government job that came with a pension, of course. Uh, his whole entire family works in government, and he quit. Can you believe it? Can you imagine what his parents said to him? <laughs> Anyways, Griffin, Griffin quit to focus on real estate and creating videos for YouTube. Today, he has four small multifamily properties, so like duplex, triplex, fourplex in Gatineau, Quebec, uh, that cash flow very nicely. Uh, plus, he's earning um, in Gatineau, Quebec, their, their prices are quite a bit lower than anything you would see in the greater Vancouver, greater Toronto area. So for those who are looking for higher cash flow and more affordability, you probably want to pay attention to the show. Uh, both in, in, in Griffin's experience, he's already cash flowing a couple uh, thousand from uh, both his real estate and from YouTube as well. So pretty cool stuff. Uh, for me, it's quite refreshing to meet such a young go-getter. I always love to see ambitious young people. Uh, so on this show, Griffin shares his numbers on his small multis and got to know, uh, books that he recommends, his favorite stocks, and his advice to beginners. To follow Griffin Milks, uh, he's on YouTube. Uh, the probably easiest thing is to just go to YouTube and spell his name, Griffin, and his last name is Milks, uh, like the beverage, M-I-L-K-S. And uh, you can also find him on Instagram if you can just spell his name, Griffin Milks. That's the easiest way to find him. Uh, please enjoy the show. Hi, Griffin. Thanks for joining us today. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks a lot for having me on the podcast. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And what's keeping you busy these days? Because I know you're a busy dude. Lots of videos on my YouTube channel, yeah. uh, lots of home renovations and actively looking for new deals, which in this market right now is is pretty difficult uh, with bidding wars and, you know, good deals, good yeah, property deals are far and few in between. So lots of lots of research. I'm also working on a couple other projects that uh, I haven't actually announced to my audience that's coming soon at the end of the month so awesome. very busy lately yeah awesome okay uh we have much to unpack there <laughs> before we get to your set questions uh, what, what's, sure. the, what's your new what's your youtube channel about what's it called uh my youtube channel is literally just my name griffin milks and mm -hmm. it's about pretty much anything investing mostly stock market though and real estate investing so i actively invest both in equity markets and in physical real estate so for me, it's just basically uh, bringing the audience along on my journey and sharing as much of the knowledge I have as possible with anyone who wants to listen and learn. Yeah. That's awesome. And now you have a substantial follower followership. Is that the term? I'm, uh, I'm, I guess. I'm, yeah, it so sounds pretty good to me. Followership. Followership. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sounds like fellowship. Fellowship of uh, Griffin Milks. Yeah. That'd be a cool name for a show. Anyways. Uh, and... Uh, what would the split be? Sorry, between between like financial markets and real estate? Uh, probably like fifteen percent real estate and mostly stocks, just because on YouTube it's uh, it's a lot more people are more interested, I guess, in stocks, just because it's a lot more uh, practical to invest. You can invest directly from your phone instead of physical real estate. But right. I love talking about real estate. I could talk about it all day. So I try to make at least two videos a month about different properties that I'm investing in. 
uh, different concept about, concepts around real estate investing mm-hmm. and breaking down numbers on deals I've done. So. Right, right. And then yeah. would you mind sharing, like, for example, for my own, for my own investing, sure. I'm well over 90% real estate. I'm quite transparent about that. And okay. financial markets, I mean, well less than 10%. How, would, how is the split of your own portfolio? Uh, let me think about that. I mean, somewhat hard to say. It's definitely more weighted towards real estate, just from the uh-huh. standpoint that through how many properties right now, I think we're at uh, five or four properties. Mm-hmm. Yeah, five properties right now. So just <laughs> through the nature of equity, uh, it is more allocated towards real estate right now, um, mm-hmm. just because straight up, you can leverage your money, uh, create forced equity through property improvements, which is really what I like to do. And so for that reason, equity markets, I don't touch margin or anything. So that's just straight up capital that I've invested from my own pocket. So yeah, I'd probably say it's about 60, 40, probably something like that. Maybe actually less, maybe like 30, 70, uh, but that fluctuates all the time. Yeah. Right. Right. And then where do you invest for real estate? O- only in uh, Gatineau actually, which is the, uh, the twin city, well, not twin city, but right on the other side of the river to Ottawa in the national capital region. It's where I grew up. And for me, it just makes sense to invest here. I can actually have my boots on the ground, do the inspections with the inspector on site and really see what I'm dealing with for my properties. Yeah. Do you mind sharing how old you are? I'm going to be 25 in four days, actually. Yeah. Wow. Happy birthday. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, are, are many... I don't talk to that many 25 year, 24, 25 year olds. Are, are, are all the, are all people your age doing this? Owning multiple properties? <laughs> uh, no, but in my circle, quite a few people have started uh, becoming actively interested in it as a result of me and other peers on, on the internet. That, that's the beauty of the internet, literally. Like my parents, for example, uh, in their 50s, they didn't have access to this. So unless people literally in your close-knit circle and or if you're really out networking you didn't have access to this amount of of knowledge so i feel like a lot of younger people are getting interested in it real estate for sure although it can be a much longer game to start getting into it because you know you need to qualify for loans you need down payments and stuff but just in general the idea of um focusing on personal finance is something i feel a lot uh, of younger people are getting interested in so i would say Quite a few people actually that I know from my my hometown, at least five, six have purchased property as well and are starting to to try and build up their real estate portfolio. But no, you're you're right in saying that not the vast majority probably is not uh, investing in real estate, but at least if you can start buying your first house, you're kind of getting your foot in the door. So yeah. I, I believe the statistic I saw just recently was it's I think it's so close to 10% of the people in the most affluent cities have more than one property. Really? Okay. But that I includes cottages, right? Okay. It includes people's recreational property. It's not, it's not just strictly investors. That's something maybe later in the conversation, I'd like to talk to you about, get your opinion about shorter term rentals for cottages. That's something that I feel a lot of people are trying to get into, but I haven't really looked into it yet. Uh, maybe you haven't some, some info. I don't know. Uh, it, I, I'm big on trying to time things personally, okay. especially for something that large of an investment, because my thinking is as travel requirements ease and lockdown eases, okay. a lot of people will, won't want their cottages anymore, right? People yeah, probably possibly. made snap decisions to buy cottages. And then when they start seeing the maintenance costs, uh, when they find that they're not going using the property as much as they expect, and they still see the mortgage payments keep coming, right? Mm-hmm. I think... I think we're probably going to see some supply come available. Okay. Right? And, and at, at a minimum, why not wait mm-hmm. till Christmas to go shopping for a vacation property? Right? Yeah, definitely. Like no different I mean, than regular real estate, right? Yeah, literally. And I, yeah, I definitely wouldn't recommend that as a first, first or at least no. second property, in my opinion. Definitely not. Because um, I have had some people ask me if that would be a good idea. And in yeah. my opinion, no. So, but... Uh, unless no, you maybe. live in cottage country, so it's like something you know it's in your backyard, maybe, maybe that makes sense for you, for for not you, but for someone out there listening. I understand, yeah, uh, I yeah, I would agree with you. I, you know, I base I invest based on economic fundamentals, meaning like immigration, 
job growth. Um, the number of people in the city is growing. Uh, diversified economy. Those are the reasons I. That's, those are the things I look for uh, for a city I invest in, right? Because I want lots of check marks that say. I want the argument to almost be like it's kind of dumb not to be investing in this place, right? It's a mistake not to be investing in this place, right? So which markets just, are you focused on in your portfolio then? Uh, for example, yeah. last month I bought two houses, uh, both in uh, Hamilton, Ontario. Okay. Right. Okay. So it's like within an hour drive of Toronto, you know, which is the economic center of Canada. Right? Literally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, uh, and the well diversified economy. Um, and these are longer term scene. rentals or Sorry? are you are these longer term rentals or you flip oh, yeah, or yeah. okay it's I'm all too longer term to, to flip right and there's so many to me there's so many more risks when you flip because uh like material costs are crazy uh <laughs> if you can get them <laughs> literally <laughs> I have lots of yeah. rentier contractors and builders who have trouble supplying like copper wiring like, as if you don't need that right <laughs> or mm -hmm. concrete or brick right like there's so many more risks and and um it's just, it's, I don't have the time for that. So I just, I buy long-term and I do mainly duplexes. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Duplexes. Yeah. yeah. And then my hope is for, uh, in a few years, I'll be able to build a, what we call a garden suite. So basically put a tiny home in the backyard that I can rent as my third apartment. Right? On the same lot, essentially. On the same lot. So basically okay. use an exist because, you know, our winters are long. <laughs> just like in oh, Gatineau, gosh. our winters yes, are long. They are. <laughs> Longer than you. For sure, <laughs> it's true. They're, yeah. they're long for all Canadians. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and uh, yeah, I want to create an, another housing unit, the same property, and I'll uh, you know rough rough numbers. I should hopefully be able to build it for two hundred grand, and I'll be sure. and, and in today's market, I could easily rent it out for two thousand dollars a month. Wow, that's significant. That would totally well, maybe not in the GTA area, but would that fully cover mortgage on that on the whole property? It's uh, well. That's on average, you know, this is still, we're talking years out. So okay. I don't even know how the financing will work. Like, but a perfect sure. world, I would be able to get a construction loan. Okay. So the bank will pay for my reno for pay for the, for the construction. Uh, and yeah, that'd be perfect world. No, that's smart. When I, uh, last time I went to Los Angeles, mm -hmm. every, you know, well, not everyone, but so many people were doing that. Literally one of the Airbnbs I stayed in was mm -hmm. that exact thing. It was just mm -hmm. a regular family. They had their house in Venice area. And then they built this vacation rental in the back. I did some quick math. They were making like over 10 grand a month from doing that. It was booked solid for six months straight. Think of that. That's crazy. From yeah, this yeah. one thing, they're not even really investing in real estate. They just built something on the property they already had. And it's fully covering the whole cost of their house. <laughs> mm -hmm. month, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's awesome. There's so many opportunities in real estate. You just have to look for them and be willing to take the leap. And then yeah. if you're even building it through a rental loan, that's, that's phenomenal. Phenomenal. <laughs> no money out of your pocket getting yeah. paid for by the tenants and it's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> At a low interest rate. And I hope you're sharing this with all your listenership because, because it's not getting easier. Nothing's getting, is, nothing's getting easier. Everything's getting more expensive. Like all, I'm sure all the stocks you follow have all, have all gone up basically. Unless, uh, oh yeah. The ones that we go down are a bit of a minority. <laughs> Like my yeah. Chinese stocks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's not talk about those right now. <laughs> yeah. It's not all sunshine and roses. My my yeah. Baba is not doing well. My Alibaba is not doing well. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so what what is your real estate strategy? What what what, what do you look for? Uh, mostly two to four unit multifamilies, mm -hmm. literally. Mm -hmm. So right now uh, in the portfolio a triplex that I'm converting to a fourplex, another fourplex, a duplex, two duplexes. And I'm selling one of the duplexes right now. So uh, literally just to, in order to kind of scale up my whole portfolio in a quicker mm -hmm. manner, I'm all about like you, the, the longer term holds, uh, that's really where the, the big money is made. But in the shorter term, uh, I have done now three burrs on duplexes and okay. pretty much just taken that money and rolled it directly into other deals that right now happen to be triplexes and fourplexes. So really the whole strategy is value add literally, and, and then just refinancing and or okay. selling depending on the deal mm -hmm. and, and just, and just growing it that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really what I, what I've been doing Fantastic. over the past two years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so most of my listeners are from Ontario 
okay. generally uh, west uh, west of of, my, of Quebec. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you tell um, someone from not from Quebec what the landlord tenant rules are like? Oh, for Quebec, if they were to invest in yeah. Quebec, yeah. If someone was say say the listeners never invested in Quebec before, mm -hmm. what would you tell them about the 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 environment, like the government environment, with how it works mm -hmm. with, with tenants and landlords? So, I've only dealt with in Quebec. It's called the Régie du Logement, which is basically the I don't know what the equivalent would be in Ontario, but landlord uh, tenant board. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There you go. There. Yeah. That's exactly. I've only dealt with that like once. I think it really just comes down to there's a lot of fear in Quebec about mm -hmm. oh investing in Quebec it's a hundred percent the the tenant has right of way and, and etc. That that hasn't necessarily been my experience. I think it's just one of those things where it comes down to managing your own risk. Like when I'm walking the property, you need to be looking at the tenants and and I'm having a conversation with them. Now, I always do that, and then I kind of judge. Well, is this something I want to take on? Right? I kind of look at the. I kind of look at what's going on in the property, how it's been managed, what current issues are. And usually my strategy involves raising rents, like renovating and raising rents. Do I think this is going to be problematic with this, this tenant? So first of all, I think of that. And then second of all, it just really comes down to like mutual respect between you and the tenants. Like they're, they're people as well. If you have a good conversation with them about, and you're open about your, your intentions in the property, there shouldn't really be any huge disputes, at least in my experience. Maybe I'm not even saying that. I don't have enough experience, but I mean, I've had at least 15 tenants in the past two years and I haven't really had any issues. Um, there's a couple of times I wanted to get tenants out. Uh, I just had literally a conversation with them about what it would take for cash for tease and just strategies like that. Um, but you know, other things, if you're, if you're a first time home buyer in Quebec and you want to live in one of the units, let's say you're buying a duplex and you want to live in one of the units, they're already rented. You literally just give six months notice, uh, written formal notice, and you're allowed to go and live in it. So I'm not sure if it's the equivalent, the same thing in Ontario, but there's things that you can do that are, that are, that are not, um, completely favorable to the tenant. Um, and yeah, I mean, I haven't really had any issues. That is something that comes up a lot though. Um, people mm -hmm. outside of Quebec asking me that, but I, I haven't really had any issues is what I would say. Yeah. Let, yeah. It's, it's similar here, especially when I talk to folks from like Alberta, <laughs> yeah. like, Oh, the, the, the tenants that rule that, uh, that environment, it's not entirely the case. Yes, but we, in what sense though, like, give me an example about uh, how brutal it would be. Oh man. Uh, in the example that you gave where you can give notice to the tenant uh, that you're moving in, uh, mm -hmm. the tenant can actually fight it. <laughs> they can appeal it and say yeah, that you're not doing it in good faith. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they can stall the process. And you could be doing it in completely good faith. But again, they could just they can just put that put that block up and then you have to go you have to go to the tribunal for it. So in that vein, then I would say, yeah, it's the same in Quebec. That is, that is the case. Like literally anything you do, let's say you send them a rent increase or whatnot. If they, if they don't, if they don't uh, respond, it automatically is deemed like uh, that they refuse it or whatnot. So in that vein, <laughs> yes. Okay. There, there could be some things that are favorable to the tenant, but the way I yeah. see it is, it's just like, again, back to what I was saying earlier, you kind of need to weigh your pros and cons when you're approaching the property. Mm -hmm. And then literally you should be taking that into account in your calculations anyways, on the return of the property. Like that's mm -hmm. what I've always done. Like what's the oh, worst yeah. case scenario. Um, and investing in property is significantly more active than like investing in stocks. You know, it takes a certain type of person to invest in, in property. You're going to be dealing with tenants. You're going to be dealing inevitably at some point with bad tenants that trash the place before leaving. I've had peers that have had properties trashed, but I think over the long run, the net positive greatly outweighs uh, greatly outweighs the negative over mm -hmm. the long run. Mm -hmm. You just need to focus on what the end goal is with real estate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I, I'll take it to like the macro level, macroeconomic level. Sure. Uh, you know, I've, I, I've said it before too, and it's not the most accurate thing where I say, oh, this real estate market's crazy. It's nuts, blah, blah, blah. Right. Mm -hmm. What really is crazy and nuts is central banks across the world have increased the money supply by around 30%, right? Since the pandemic started. So there's 30% more money in this, in the economy. And lo and behold, our real estate market went up 30%, you know? Is it cause and effect? 
maybe a little bit, right? So it, has stuff really got more expensive or really it just takes more dollars to buy something caused by money deflation? Sure. I mean, we've seen that across pretty much all asset classes in the past exactly. two years, right. paper assets as well. Yeah. It just makes sense, right? Devaluation yeah. of the dollar, people are taking their money out of literally liquid cash because it's eroding away purchasing power, putting it in real estate, putting it in. We saw it less now, but at the beginning of the pandemic, gold shot up. Same thing with stocks. People are just trying to find any way possible yeah. to, to, to make a return on their investment. So okay. um, definitely makes sense yeah. for sure. This is impressive, Griffin. Uh, you're 24 years old, and you're, I'm having a I'm having this conversation with someone who's 24 years old. I can't have this conversation with lots of people who are 50 years old. <laughs> oh well, I mean, it literally just comes down to interest, though. I mean, it, I breathe this stuff day in and day out. I mean, I make content about it, so I have to always be up to date with what's going on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I have a question for you then. Like, okay. like, we all have a reason why we got into real estate investing. Like, for me, uh, I was a bit younger, I was just around your age where I wasn't making enough money in my job, right? Yep. Literally opening up the pay stub and like 10 deductions. I have a car loan to pay. I have a girlfriend okay. to afford. I can't, I need to make more money. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yep. That was one of the early catalysts. What was, what was your catalyst to invest to real estate or stock, whatever, what have you? Yeah, there were a couple. I would say the main, well, first and foremost, I've always been interested in, in money. Uh, ever since I was a kid, kind of like I, I liked, yeah, this sounds a bit ridiculous, but I always liked having new stuff, new, new gadgets, whatever. So like money was always a thing I, that interested me. And then as I started getting older, you know, 14, got my first job, realizing that I can actually create some income. I've always been, I've always worked really hard. Uh, and then through university, uh, I kind of, that kind of slipped away a little bit for like maybe a year or two at the beginning, uh, where I was, you know, enjoying my college years. Uh, but then following that kind of transitioning into a government job, I just realized that it, it wasn't really what I wanted with, with my life. And so it comes down to what are you going to do about it? And for me, it was, okay, well, the only way I can get out of this is A, with a business, and then B, for the longevity of this and not having to work and for 40 years, I need to, to invest my, my, my money, literally. So that was a struggle for a while, but it pretty much just comes down the catalyst to wanting to, uh, yeah, as cliche as it sounds, be, be at some point financially free and then be able to do whatever, whatever the heck I want, whenever I want. That's really what I want to achieve. Uh, and so that was the catalyst. That's cool. What, what did you do for the government? Uh, I was a business analyst. So worked um, hand in hand with like database analysts and we would create different applications for, for data. Um, things like um, things like pensions and different. I'm trying to think it was like a year ago at this point, but yeah, basically I worked for ESDC. So everything that had to do with pensions stuff like student student loans, um, RESPs, things like that. And then we would create applications to sift through that data, both internally and externally. But it wasn't something that, that I was super passionate about. So I just wanted to find a way out. So, yeah. So you, so you had pretty good knowledge of what pensions look like? Uh, yes and no. I mean, not really, because I was just dealing like literally on uh, that. That was just one of the projects that our whole department did. I, I never worked uh -huh. on that project. But uh -huh. what do you mean you, about how the pensions work? Would you have been entitled to a pension in this role? Oh, absolutely. I would have. Yeah, yeah for sure. And are you still there at the government? No, no, I do. You said uh, no do say goodbye to that pension. <laughs> uh, Your real estate's going to be my pension straight up. Like I'm going to blow my real estate portfolio up yeah hang on this is a defined benefit pension that you said no to yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right for the listeners benefit the defined defined benefit pension means that uh what griffin gets paid is set right as in he's entitled to uh basically an indexed to inflation dollar amount guaranteed well it was like dependent on it was like the best it was the average of i think yeah i think it was about the five best years or something like that but 
yeah, I would have been entitled to it, but at 60 or 55, depending since I started earlier, probably would have been like 55. But I mean, that's in 30 years. And I know a lot, pretty much everyone discouraged me from doing it. But at the end of the day, uh, if you're, yeah, I'm young. And if you're, if you're not satisfied every day in and day out with what you're doing, like I just uh-huh. needed to do something different. And that's how, uh, that's how I viewed it. I want to allocate kill for a defined benefit pension. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Most people would, but, uh, it's one of those things where you just need to follow your inner voice. So, uh, right, again, for the listeners benefit, uh, I think the statistic is, I believe it's over 60% of Canadians who do not have a pension will never be able to afford to retire. So for listener benefit, that's what Griffin said no to. He wants to be, he thinks he's going to be one of those minorities that's going to actually be able to retire. <laughs> well, I mean, look at your, well, there's a thing too, define retirement, right? Like if I don't have thousands of doors by the time I'm 55, I will have failed my mission. So, and, and if I have thousands of doors, a $70,000 a year pension will, I, I, yeah. Anyways, it's just back to what you were saying earlier what was it? 10% of Canadians as a whole have more than one property. You know, I already have like four or five. So I don't know. I I just kind of weighed my pros and cons and Mm -hmm. I can do something every single day that I love making Mm -hmm. videos, talking about investments and, Mm -hmm. uh, and making income from that. Like I've always been an entrepreneur ever since I was a kid. So that's what I wanted to do. And maybe I'll regret it, but, uh, I hope not. Yeah. That's what I would say to that. Yeah, you're probably trending in the right direction. I don't think you're regretting much. Uh, so who <laughs> told you, you this was a bad idea to to say goodbye to the job and the pension? Uh, well, I wouldn't say anyone said black on white, it's a bad idea, but yeah. reading through the lines, I mean, pretty much everyone there, uh, but then also, <laughs> uh, but then also, you know, it, it's not necessarily the concept of bad idea, but it's more the concept of, of, uh, of worry, you know, people in my, my circle, my family or whatnot. Um, it's, it's a risk for sure. Uh, even you, as I'm saying this, you, you seem almost like taken aback by the decision, but, um, yeah, it was those people pretty much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pretty much everyone who back. is in those positions. I mean, but that's all they know. So they don't know any different. They don't know the life of entrepreneurship or, or and what that can bring. So it's through a lens of their own reality. So they're just projecting their own reality and how inconceivable that is. But at the end of the day, I now talk with entrepreneurs every day. And to them, it's like a no brainer, you know? So, yeah. I think the other thing that's a no brainer for entrepreneurs is to not take advice from non-successful people. Yeah. And well, but successful, like I, I know people that were at the government, they're multimillionaires. Like they've been investing for 30 years. They're, they're yeah. super successful and, yeah. or not even from a monetary standpoint, they're successful in that they're happy with their role. And if they are, right. then great. That's awesome. Uh, but for me, it's just not the path I saw for myself for, for 30 years. Another thing that didn't help was also just the fact that I wasn't surrounded with like super, super like-minded people. Uh, I was, uh, 23 when I worked there and the closest person to my age above me was in their mid thirties. The average was like 50. So for me, like I just didn't relate and it just wasn't, uh, wasn't for me. Yeah. Yeah. Cause before we were recording, I was telling you, uh, most, most of my clients are usually late. Uh, the youngest is usually late thirties. That's the, my typical client and they typically have kids. Yeah. And they already are a homeowner. Right. And the fact that they're a homeowner, in the greater Toronto area, they've amassed significant equity in their homes for sure, which is how they afford down payments for investment properties. Right. Mm -hmm. That's not you. (laughs) Mm. Actually, that's a great question then for the starter investor. Like how did you assemble uh, capital to start investing? First of all, I started investing. Well, let's, because this podcast is more about, uh, about real estate, let's just talk about that. So for my first property deal, I mean, it came down to $12,000. I mean, I bought my first duplex for 182,000. I know that sounds absurd in Toronto (laughs) and it kind of is also absurd for this market. It was the cheapest duplex on the market in over (laughs) two years. Uh, flipped that in eight months, sold it for 260,000 ish. So yeah. So back to the question of how did I amass 12 grand? I mean, 12 grand was literally just 
saving for a long time, eating ramen noodles. And uh, it literally just comes down to that. Did I want it? Yes, I did. So I needed to do sacrifices. I didn't go out and pay for bottle service uh, with my friends. And uh, I just saved as much as I could and worked 80 hour weeks, 40 hours at work, and then 40 hours on ventures, four of which more than that failed. And then finally, YouTube started picking up at some point. And now that's what I do full time with real estate investing. Uh, yeah. Can you share what projects didn't work out? Because a part of the show is to like, I want, I, I'd love for the listener to find the fastest, easiest path to mm. financial, some sort of financial freedom, financial uh, security. Right. And this isn't yeah. about great rich quick, okay. but you know, I'm on YouTube and I see, and those ads keep coming through promoting fast money, right? Quick, easy money. Right. Sure. Like, can, can you share from your experience what didn't work so then people can hopefully uh, decide for themselves where to focus their attention? Sure. Yeah. Um, so multiple different things. First of all, I uh, had a clothing brand for a while that didn't work. Why? Because I quickly realized that margins were relatively low when you're a smaller business that isn't out, like sourcing a lot of your garments overseas and also, it's such a competitive market that you need huge advertising spend. So I hadn't, I didn't raise capital or anything or take on debt in order to fuel that business, which pretty much blowing up a clothing brand comes down to, to marketing and, and like huge branding deals and stuff like that with influencers, paid ads, stuff like that. That just for me didn't work. Um, so that was one business. Another business I had that was really interesting was I... <laughs> I was doing branding and merchandise for creators on YouTube. So I had a couple of clients that we were three, by the way, on that business, but we had a couple of clients that had multiple million subscribers and we did okay money, uh, but it just came down to the fact that for me, yeah, some of the clients, it was just too problematic. There were too many moving parts in that business and working full time. And then also trying to do YouTube videos was something that, that was, it was just too much. I was overwhelmed. I was working like 90 hour weeks and it ended up just not working out kind of how to fall, fall out. But so what you're, okay. So your question is how the fastest way for people without a get rich quick thing, right? You know, people uh, ask me that sometimes. Quick, get rich reliably, you know, that'd be a great way to do it. <laughs> Yeah. I, but here's the thing. Here's the thing, right? For me, it really just came down to trying three, four businesses. It, it just comes down to that. Like you just need to try. People ask me that all the time. Like, okay, what is something I should do? Well, okay. First of all, you need to try multiple different businesses. Finally, and that complement your skills. So why did YouTube work for me? Well, I've always been making videos ever since I was a kid, I would make like snowboard videos and, and that doesn't, correlate one-to-one -one with what I'm doing right now. It's completely different, but I've always been into videography and then, oh, I also like investing now. So why not talk about investing and, and, and making videos also interests me. So just try to find something that complements your skill set and, and, and go from there. And you need to stay consistent with it. For over a year, about two years, I'd get uh, no views pretty much, like 100 to 200 views per video. And did I stop? No, I just kept going because I knew it would work. I saw peers in this space making good amounts of money and I was just consistent with it. And I knew deep down it would work. I just knew it was going to work. So have faith in yourself and, and stay consistent with your craft. Try different things out. Right. It's pretty much and all I can say. I mean, you know, there's but no, you did uh, eventually pull the plug on some of these projects. Okay. So like, when did I know type of thing? Yeah, because because you know one of the things that's taught that's taught out there, and as a okay. one-liner, it's great. Never give up. <laughs> right? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But do you still have the clothing brand? And <laughs> I think you need you need to just look at like, yeah, why? So why did I give up on those? Um, wasn't make, time. pretty much just didn't make enough money. Yeah, for my yeah. return on time. That's pretty much what it was. Uh, you kind of just know at some point, like it fizzles out. I can't really give a clear answer as to that. I just, right. for some reason, I knew that YouTube stuff was going to work if I just stay consistent versus those businesses, which also are a lot harder to scale because it was physical products mm -hmm. and digital products are way easier to scale if you have an audience. So I knew that as soon as I, if I could get a, a substantial audience, which mm -hmm. by the way, like 10,000, 20,000 is 
decent if you have a niche on your on your, with your with your content. So I knew that if I could do that, I could at least at the very minimum make a couple thousand dollars a month to sustain my living expenses and then try to transition away from what I was doing in the day and then just go all in, which would then compound because I'd have more time to put mm-hmm. into it and then it would just take off and, and that's kind of what happened. Yeah. Fascinating. So so let's talk a bit more stocks. Sure. So you you uh so you buy stocks. Um, what can you describe your strategy? Buy and hold, dividend. Definitely buy and hold. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely buy and hold. A lot of people are interested in dividend stocks, and uh, I am as well. I make content about dividend stocks all the time. However, I think that for people just starting out, it makes more money, and more sense to invest your capital back into things that are going to generate you more money, like, like a side hustle or something like that. In my experience, you know, investing a thousand dollars into dividend stocks that has like a 3% return. I mean, in a year you're making 30 bucks, which it's great and all, but you're going to have a, you're going to create more equity and return on something where you can you can scale and once you have a substantial amount of capital to invest with well then it makes sense to make the 3 to 5% dividend return anyways i kind of kind of went off on a tangent there but yes definitely my strategy is more of a buy and hold i think for the average person index funds and etfs are also one of the best things and i know that's kind of like a it's not, it's not the most interesting thing, you know, investing consistently into exchange traded funds, but I've had great success over the past several years with, with index funds, often greatly beating some of my, my individual picks. Uh, it's one of the easiest things that people can do. And even though, yeah, most of my content is about individual stocks for the average person who has a day job and, or a business taking the enough, having enough time to actively search for individual stocks that make sense for their own goals uh, doesn't really, it can make sense, but it, it's, it takes a lot of time to do. And it, you're better off usually just investing in index funds. Mm-hmm. That, that's usually what I, what I, uh, what I recommend that people do. That's and then when it comes down to a strategy, uh, I can't really comment on that because everyone has it. Like different stocks are, are are best for different people. So I usually just tell people to really focus on what they're trying to get out of it, but to not focus on making returns in less than a six month period. Period. Yeah. Because in most peer in most people, when you think stocks, they think the one off stock that's going to be a ten bagger. So then they go and look for that exclusively, and that's when you get burned. That's why most people don't have success with stocks over time is because they don't, they underestimate the power of consistent compounding over time because it's so boring to think of. It's super boring. Oh, you're going to compound your money. It's super boring. But like, if you're always trying to look for a 100, uh, like let's say a 10 X stock all the time, you're probably going to never, never find one and, or you're going to sell out way too quick. And it's just not going to compound over time. And then you're going to be, you're going to try and find one that you think is going to, you think is going to be a 10 bagger. And then it's just going to burn you and you're going to lose your gains on any of the other stocks. It's interesting because the same thing can be said about real estate. Like some people don't start because they're looking for the home run. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, it's right. true. And if you're a beginner looking for a home run, you don't think the pros are looking for home runs too? And who do you think is going to get to it first? <laughs> hey, this way, like Peter Lynch, for example, huge hedge fund manager from back in the day. Uh, he has invested in over a thousand stocks, thousands of stocks. And m- usually more than half don't, don't perform well at all. When you hold a thousand stocks, though, like it's inevitable you're going to have huge winners and huge losers. But another thing that, that's really interesting is that typically speaking, when you look at your portfolio of individual stocks over time, it's really the tail end that is going to be, it's, it's going to be two, maybe five, two to five stocks in a large portfolio that are going to make like 80% of all your gains, mm-hmm. literally 80, 20 rule. And mm-hmm. if I look at my stocks over time, yep, that's literally what happens. Mm-hmm. And so what you can do is, is just 
invest in broader market index funds because it's way easier to invest in stocks and ETFs than in real estate when you're first starting out. And just don't don't get caught up on those ads you were talking about earlier about get rich quick and trying to find, trying to day trade and all that. If you, if you really just focus on a longer term approach, it makes mm-hmm. sense. And coming from a 24 year old, it sounds like I try to tell that to my friends and stuff. They just underestimate the power of that, uh, of just investing consistently over time right. and feeding your investment por- portfolio with more capital because from working your butt off at work and then also a side hustle to create more income investing an extra like thousand or two thousand dollars a month over 10 years is hundreds of thousands of dollars difference in your investment portfolio but it it just doesn't seem like that in the moment when you're when you're just looking at your portfolio that has 10 grand in it you know and you're always looking for the yeah exactly and to your your example about how like what like a small number of stocks just like kill it just look at like the tsx and shopify (laughs) exactly no exactly (laughs) shopify out of nowhere becomes the so that's a great example right in the canadian market in the past year there's maybe five stocks that are like larger stocks i'm not talking like really small penny stocks that are super volatile but large cap stocks that have made you know 500 return in the past couple of years like everyone's always looking for those and those are fantastic if you're holding them um, but they're, they're far and few in between. Yeah. And usually it's, it's a couple stocks that are going to make the difference in your yeah. portfolio. Yeah. One of them used to be Nortel. <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, they were, they made up a humongous portion of the TSE, TSE back, back then, but it was a lar- it was worth a large percentage of the TSE back then. But yeah, we all know where that went. And uh, so on the show, we do talk a bit about stock options. I, my understanding is that's not something that you're that you do. No, not not really. I don't trade options too much. I, personally, I think for the for the average investor, uh, it's it's usually not something that I that I recommend. But so you talk about that often on on the on the show with guests and stuff who trade options. Or what's your yeah. take then on options trading? Do you do it a lot? Or? Yeah, I'll even sell. I'll sell options on ETFs. You know, okay. we're gonna do. I'm gonna do QQQ. I think we're gonna actually. I think we're already after four o'clock. But <laughs> uh, yeah, we <laughs> if are. If I wasn't doing yeah. this, I would have sold options on QQQ right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so for the listeners' benefit, that's like first off, none of this, folks, is advice. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Griffin and I are talking about experience and our own personal opinions. None of this is should be considered financial advice. But yeah, I was gonna sell. I was gonna sell. Um, do a put spread on the Nasdaq, basically, right? just like way out of the money, just to earn some cash flow. Uh, yeah, because I don't like risk either. And uh, when you do when you do the Nasdaq again, ETF, you know, I I can I don't have to be right. I, that's the whole point. Yeah, yeah. On, on a specific, I don't have stocks. to be right to make money. Right. Mm-hmm. I can be quite wrong and still make money. I just can't be extremely wrong. Right. And even if I do, I have I bought insurance as well. Oh well, there you go cover covering your bases yeah yeah I'm happy to share with you after we're done recording is it's, it's a bit over the head of like you said like the average person has no idea what we're talking about <laughs> yeah I just think so here's here's one of the main reasons why I say that just just to explain why I said that mm-hmm. we're bombarded every single day with so much content around making money, investing, et cetera, that people are, for example, thinking, okay, I want to invest in real estate. I want to invest in stocks. Oh, maybe I should start learning about stock options and I'm still working my day job. I maybe want to have a business on the side. I just think it's so easy to get diluted oh, yeah. and it's it's a lot better to just really focus on one or two things that you're really mm-hmm. good at. Like that, that's mm-hmm. kind of why uh, I say that. Mm-hmm. And uh, for me personally, it's worked. So I always recommend right, right. what works for me. Right, right. So, well, I, I don't recommend what works for me, but I just share my experience about what has worked for me. Mm-hmm. And for me, that has been focusing on one or two things. Right, right, right. So. Uh, and everyone's context is different. So I'll share some of the numbers exactly. about how property I just bought in, in Hamilton. So the duplex I bought is, get ready. Uh, okay. I paid close to eight fifty for it. Okay. Right? And it's yep. going to rent for about 3,600 per, per unit. No, no, no. Total. total. Okay. Okay. Total around there. No, maybe a little more. 
30, 3,800, somewhere around there. I still have to rent out the main floor, right? So I don't know what it's going to be. But those are my projected numbers when it is rented, right? Can you share what the numbers on your duplex is? <laughs> yeah. So what are we looking at in terms of a revenue multiple there? You said 3,600 per month. A month, yeah. Yeah. So it's what? Plus like hydro. 40, 40... That's, the, that's the kicker. Oh, <laughs> uh, you're paying for hydro? No, no, they're going to pay for hydro. Okay. I was going to say that. <laughs> I still have to pay for the heat and water. Nail in the coffin there. I Yeah, I never I never pay for that. Or at least I try not to. If if that's currently on a lease, I try to get rid of that as soon mm-hmm. as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, especially in Ontario. Like hydro is crazy expensive compared to Quebec. Crazy everywhere. <laughs> well, in Quebec, it's not. It's really not. Uh, it's so cheap. But uh, yeah, numbers on on our property. So a duplex, I've never purchased a duplex for more than 300,000. Okay. And it de- obviously depends on the conditions of the place and, and the area in the city. But I would say average average rents for say a two bedroom is 1,100 to, to 1,200 right now. So let's say I purchased last year, purchased a duplex for 280,000. And it it can be rented for for twenty four hundred a month total easily. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So those are nice numbers. Yeah, I mean, I always try to purchase things that are at revenue multiples of below twelve annual mm-hmm. revenues, which mm-hmm. is inconceivable in other markets that I'm well aware of. Um, but yeah, and then I always try to at least cash flow one hundred and fifty bucks a month per door. That's usually my my goal. Yeah, uh, I think the Ottawa listeners will be into your market next weekend. No, oh, they are. Because <laughs> Ottawa, they are. Ottawa people pay similar prices to what I pay. Yeah. Right? No, they already are. I've seen it in the past year when I do visits and stuff. It's all mm-hmm. it's all English speaking folk uh, over on on the Quebec side buying buying because to them it's a huge deal, right? It, it's literally a steal to them in their mind. Yeah. Uh, for, for me, I look at like a place that goes for a hundred K over asking. I'm like, what are these people thinking? But coming from other, other markets, it makes sense. So how far is the drive from Ottawa? Oh, five minutes. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> oh, well, depending on where you are, it's 10 seconds, but I, from my house, it's about 10 minutes. Yeah. I'm surprised your markets aren't similar in price then. Uh, it's, it's catching up, but it's just that fear of, of Quebec. It's that fear of, uh, the tenant board and the, the French speaking people, oh. uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You should, you'd be motivated to spread more fear then. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Guys, if you're listening to this and you don't speak French, get out of here. You won't be able to have fine success. All the contracts are in French, right? <laughs> exactly. You're, you're screwed. You're screwed. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Here's here's a fun question. Um, so uh, let let's let's assume you don't own any real estate. You don't have the opportunity to live at home, right? Say you have a million dollars of cash in your account, right? You know mm-hmm. no other assets. You have your existing skill set. What would you do with it? How would you deploy that million dollars? <sighs> Dogecoin, stir it up. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't even talk about cryptos yet. <laughs> uh, oh man, um, think about this. Please, folks, million... that was not advice. No, no, no. I was <laughs> totally joking. joking. I was one hundred percent joking. A uh, million dollars. Do I have any any credibility at the bank or anything? Like, am yeah, I so able to? Okay. Yeah, I would just do a monumental flip on a on a larger deal. It's something mm-hmm. I've been wanting to do for. Wait, would I have the same knowledge? Yeah, yeah. You, you are yeah. who you are. It's just yeah. that you don't. You're perf- like, uh, just say for example, you liquidated everything. You have under sure. All, under, I, I, I would go and cash. yeah, I would, would go and you, find. How would you, how would you restart? Or, yeah, I'd go and find one or two partners probably, and I would go in on a pretty large multifamily. Well, it wouldn't be multifamily anymore. I'd probably go on like a, a a poorly managed, like 50 unit building or something like that. That's probably what I would do knowing what I know right now, but I would have to uh, have, yeah, I'd go and get a good contractor and and I'd buy something in my market and flip that and make a, make millions of dollars off of it. That's (laughs) what I would do probably pretty unrelatable answer actually. And I think of it, but Hey, that's probably it's... what I would do. Or mm-hmm. on the really, really, really easy mm-hmm. answer, I would just sure. buy I would buy Amazon stock. 
I'd buy a million dollars worth of Amazon stock. That's probably what I would do. Okay, I'm gonna okay. <laughs> have, to have a peek at that later. I was gonna wait till like Alibaba started going back up and <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean Amazon is literally the cheapest it's been from an earnings standpoint in over a decade. Hmm. Yeah. You get commission for saying these things? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Not at all. No, not at all. <laughs> Especially you wouldn't be from Amazon, that's for sure. They don't care. <laughs> yeah, their stock, uh, their stock. It's like it's like Tesla cars. They sell themselves. They don't even need to advertise. Yeah, I, I, I was telling, I, I readily admit I have way too many Amazon boxes at my house and some of them aren't even opened yet. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I literally, everyone buys from it. That's one of the easiest things you can do for an investment. You, you just open your eyes. I'm driving down my street. I see everyone has an Amazon box on their yeah. on their porch. And then you look at their, their income statement and you see that they made over a billion dollars for the fourth quarter in a row. A hundred billion, I should say. Like it's just, yeah. And it's cheapest. It's the cheapest it's been in 10 years. Yeah. I, I bought yeah. these. I bought my headset off Amazon. This mic on Amazon. This mic stand on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Same here. Amazon, the plants from Amazon, the rugs from Amazon. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's not even talking about Amazon Web Services. It's not yeah, talking yeah, yeah. about all that stuff. So, anyways, we won't go on about Amazon. No, but we'll yeah, go on on Amazon. that's an easy way. Yeah. That would be an easy way to invest. Yeah, but I would, I would just add to that, that they've saved me so much time. That's one of my favorite things about Amazon is I don't have to go get in the car, drive 15 minutes each way, use gas. I mean, there are times <laughs> where I get into the car and I go to Walmart and I'm with my girlfriend and I'm like, so if, why are we here? I've just wasted 45 minutes of my time. I could have just ordered it on Amazon. Like I wanted it today, but I could get it tomorrow. <laughs> like literally, why are we here? You know? So yeah, it, the company that provides the most value is what's going to create the largest impact. And that's literally why Jeff Bezos is the richest guy on the planet mm -hmm. publicly because he provided the most value to everyone. I can't imagine who saved people more time. <laughs> if you, if, if anyone measured that metric. Literally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a bit of a personal question. Uh, sure. If you don't mind, feel free to not answer it. Is your girlfriend supportive of what you're doing? Was she there 100%. when you gave up the government job and pension? hundred percent oh yeah 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 and if she didn't yeah i don't know where i'd be right now if she yeah. didn't so yeah it's so important to have someone that supports you like that i don't know if you've heard it before but i've seen it many times with clients and just in discussion with people uh i often will ask people um like interesting conversation they'll say oh my brother doesn't invest actually that's not fair they'll say their family member doesn't invest but their spouse things real estate is risky or stocks okay. are risky or stock options are risky, whatever. And then they don't do anything or they at least use that as an excuse not to do anything. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, I'm happy to hear that you have a supportive partner uh, because in my experience, the partner, uh, like, I mean, like romantic partner uh, yep. has to be at least be neutral for the, for the investor to, to have any sort of success. Right. If they were, if they're more like an anchor, versus uh you know being a neutral right then if they're an anchor as soon as anything goes sideways like they'll say uh i told you so right mm -hmm. say your tenant uh you know uh say you have a you have a toilet leak thousand two thousand dollar water bill see i was right i told you so griffin i told you so man yeah i i yeah i couldn't imagine that literally that that wouldn't fly for me uh and it would just I don't understand. Yeah. I, I don't understand why, uh, how, how you could feel good about that. Literally. No. Also, she's been there, uh, since way before, like when I was cutting grass for the city. So, uh, she's, she's seen it all. So, yeah. That's awesome. Congrats. Mm -hmm. All right. Griffin, I want to say thank you so much for your time. Uh, can you tell us, I, I believe you have courses. Oh, uh, yeah. 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 I do have one, uh, stock market investing course. I'm telling you guys right now, it's not a day trading course. However, it's literally about learning to, to understand the markets, understanding yourself as an investor, and then uh, building a portfolio that suits your needs. 
Uh, you can find it pretty much in all the, the descriptions of my videos. If you're interested on my YouTube channel, as I said at the beginning, it's just my name, Griffin Milks. And you can also find me on Instagram, Griffin Milks as well. Awesome. I'll follow yeah. you later. <laughs> I don't have my phone with I don't have. Uh, I do have my phone with me. <laughs> uh, Griffin, I like to ask my guests if they have any final words that they'd like to share. Like, like well, anything you want to say to the listener, what would you say? Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on, on the podcast. It was, it was a lot of fun, but to the listeners, what I would say is if you are interested in real estate and you haven't taken the first step, literally just learn as much as possible, read a bunch of books. That's the number one thing that's helped me at the beginning, getting me, getting knowledgeable about the whole concepts, maybe reach out to someone, you know, who also has, has invested in, in, in some property, try to get some information and just save up towards that first down payment, even though it might seem it might seem far fetched, depending on your on your market that, that it's getting more and more expensive. Well, the reality is that that's what's happening. So so just buckle down, get that first down payment, and uh, and don't give up to to yeah start investing in real estate. That's probably what I would say. Amazing. Most people who have talked to me about real estate haven't haven't actually purchased their first property. So it really comes down to just learning as much as possible, knowing at least what you're doing from from knowledge and theory, because you're going to get more experience when you're in the field purchasing something. But just take that leap, buy something and uh, trust the process. Know what you're getting into the property, though, for sure. And make do an inspection on your property. Yeah. I was talking to someone today. If you, because he asked any home inspector, the business is way down. I inspect every property. <laughs> Wait, business is down for home inspectors. Oh yeah, in my area, business is through the roof. Like I can't even get some sometimes. That's that's mm. strange. Maybe some uh, get but, back in the business. <laughs> but I I do know that a lot of uh, my my agent was telling me that a lot. Uh, sorry, the amount of offers getting accepted without an inspection clause has skyrocketed over the past year because it's so competitive that people are like, I don't even want to do an inspection because for the seller, it's an unknown and then it could whatever, which I understand from the seller standpoint, but yeah, I haven't purchased a property without an inspection uh, clause yeah. in there. I wouldn't, I did an inspection the other day the building looked awesome. Turns out there was water damage absolutely everywhere, humidity through the roof. These are things you can't even see from your naked eye when you're walking through. So definitely important to do in my opinion. Right, right. And my experience is the same. I've bought properties sight unseen. I wouldn't recommend it, but I have bought some without inspection, without inspection condition as well, cash offers, but I'll still have it inspected, right? Even when, after the deal's firm, I'll still have it inspected because I need to know what's wrong with it. Yeah, exactly. And I need to give a list to my contractor. I mean, that's a lot more of an aggressive tactic. I'm assuming you didn't do that on your first properties. No. Exactly. So yeah, right? of course. It's, everyone's different. Right. I, 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 again, I had pictures already. For example, I had someone I knew through, go through the property. Like they already noted, noted the asbestos and the, the age of the boiler and stuff like that. So I just budget for all of it. Right. And we still had some surprises. <laughs> so I had to end up waterproofing a basement for 10 G's. Mm, yeah. <laughs> but you know, I'm planning on holding this thing forever. I probably would have, I budgeted for it as well. Cause at one, in one day, I will probably have to waterproof almost all my basements. Right. So, you know, I either do it today or do it five years from now, right? So I have the budget yeah. for all of it. Uh, now, you mentioned read books. Can you share some name some titles? Yeah, sure. Like in the Canadian market, one I really liked, and your viewers are probably aware of it, but uh, Real Estate uh, Retirement Plan, I really liked that one. It's by Caleb Ross. I'm totally not affiliated with him in any way, shape, or form, but I really like that book. Uh, I would say just start start with that, and uh, that'll give you like most of the the key tips. Like, there's a couple others I have. Man, I haven't talked to Callum in ages. They're not even here. But uh, wait, yeah, this one, this one here. But this is like a Bible that's a lot. It's pretty dry to read. Legal tax accounting strategies for Canadian real estate investors, but I wouldn't recommend that as a first book. It'll turn you off to the whole idea of property investing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're friends with Callum? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I've known Callum for ages. I, I've been, I was a Ray member for over a decade. Cool. I really like his book. It's awesome. Super motivating. Uh, and then, did you ever read Rich Dad Poor Dad? Yeah, I just didn't mention it because it's like 
bread and butter, but yes, yeah. that, that, that one's also a good one. The only thing is ab- about that. It's great to get you in the mindset where like, I, yeah, I read that probably when I was 18, I was just reading through it. I couldn't get enough because it's concepts. I, I didn't know, like, you don't, you don't know what you don't mm-hmm. know, but quite a few things are kind of like surface level. And, and a, a couple of things are also American focused. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you yeah. can't apply it as much, but it is, it's a great book as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. That's like the good are- that Sorry. everyone's read, uh, like one of the first ones that everyone's read, you know? Yeah, yeah. But again, we have some, li- some people completely new to this, uh, listening, talking, thinking, hearing about real estate for the first time. So I think that's a good place to start as well. Copies and run this- for, I think eight bucks. So pick one up. It's super cheap. It's a cheap book and it's great. Yeah. And it's a game changer for, mm-hmm. for, for many, especially like probably, you know, that might be a book you hand out to your friends that still work for the government. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know how taxes work? <laughs> yeah. Well, based on how, uh, based on your reaction earlier, I don't think, well, yeah, they can, yeah, they can invest, uh, while they're still there, but yeah. 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 And if you check YouTube, uh, Robert Kiyosaki does have a video talking about how to sell options. <laughs> it's very old. There you go. It helped validate the strategy for myself. And I think that's it. Uh, Griffin, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, actually, no, I wanted, I wanted, like you had those final words. They weren't, now they're not your final words anymore. <laughs> true. Would true. you change anything for someone young, um, for someone in their twenties? Cause my thing is, uh, I'm more concerned for the person who are, I'm concerned for everyone starting out, mm-hmm. especially for folks, uh, like, like remember I mentioned my typical client already owns their home, right? What about the person who doesn't already own a home and doesn't have an equity base to invest? Does your advice change at all for that person? Maybe they need to go to Gatineau so, so they can actually have a down payment for something. <laughs> well, I mean, if you want to start investing in real estate and your market is just so expensive, it, yeah. it pretty much comes down to a handful of things. A, go into a different market that's cheaper. B, get a partner. Nothing wrong with that either. Split the deal or even three partners. Those are pretty much the things you can do. Maybe you can enlighten me on some others, but that, yeah, that's pretty much all you can do or just work way harder and make more money, make more income, mm-hmm. you know? So that, that's probably what I would recommend. Griffin, again, do you, do you so agree with that? Or, do you agree with yeah, that? pretty much. Yeah. Or, or, or uh, Oh, thank you, mom and dad. <laughs> yeah. Well that, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you have that luxury, great, but I, yeah. 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 <laughs> and then for the listener's benefit, it, that is the reality. Uh, at least in our market, I, I don't even know what the number is, but it is a, um, a significant majority of mortgages by millennials. Uh, they have health and parents. It's just the reality of things, right? If not parents, then grandparents, whatever. Yeah. I mean, people who do have that option, that that's fantastic for them for sure. Right. For sure. Because like, would you rather wait and try to save up the money or would you, like even you said, you said get a partner. Why not a parent? Why not a brother? Yeah, well, uh, I would say the main reason just because it depends, usually your partner, like you should, it should, he should, he or she should be minded with the same goal versus a parent, it, depending on, on their whole mindset and strategy around property investing, it mm-hmm. could become mm-hmm. more problematic. Yeah, I don't know. Right. They want their money back. Mm-hmm. It's so case by case, of course. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, that's why. Unless your parents, like, if your parent is super adamant about it, they understand the whole strategy. Great. But if they're just, I guess there's a difference too if they're putting money up or if they're just co-signing. But yeah, mm-hmm. of course, just 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 play it by ear. Uh, mm-hmm. And every situation is going to be different. Yeah, it's no different than what I was saying about like a romantic partner. The yeah. parent has to be at a minimum neutral. <laughs> Exactly. They cannot yeah. be an anchor <laughs> and dragging you behind. All right. Again, I don't know how many times I thank you, Griffin. It's such a Canadian show. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about it. <laughs> no, no. It was great. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. And uh, maybe at some point in the future, we can do it again. We'll see. Amazing. Love to. All right. All right. Thanks again. Sweet. See you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.